Okay. I'll reiterate, if anybody wants to see my tattoos, I'll show them later. <laughs> so it's a huge honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I organized a meeting once about 10 years ago, once. It was a huge amount of work, so great thanks to you guys who put this together. I know it's, a, it's not a small thing. Okay, so today I want to talk about um, the ventral visual pathway. And for the last 15 years, I and lots of other people, including probably many of you, uh, have been using functional MRI to figure out how the ventral pathway is organized. Um, and I think one of the most robust and salient facts that we see in this organization of the ventral pathway um, is shown schematically here. And that is that um, this pathway contains a number of regions, each of which responds very specifically to a very particular category of visual stimulus. Okay, now why focus on these blobs of the uh, dozens, perhaps hundreds of blobs of, that have been reported in the enormous literature of functional imaging of uh, visual cortex? Well, I'd say these, these regions are unusual in a few respects. First of all, um, the effect size. Each of these regions responds a, at least twice as strongly to its preferred category as to pretty much any category it's ever been tested on. Um, and I like big effects. I don't like messing around with uh, tiny effects that take too much work to discover. And I think that when there's a big salient effect um, out there, that means nature's trying to tell you something. So each of these is a very big effect. A friend of mine once said, if you have a new scanner and you want to know if it's working, try a localizer for the parahippocampal place area. If you can't detect it, your scanner isn't working. So these things are very, very strong and robust. Second of all, each of these things is present in essentially every normal person. They're just part of the basic architecture of the human brain. And so I think that too is telling us something sort of fundamental about them. Uh, now, of course, the situation is more complicated than this very simple-minded diagram here. Um, first of all, uh, nature doesn't produce perfect little ovals with sharp edges outlined in black. Uh, so to symbolize the fact that these, there's some mess around the edges of these things, not yet fully characterized, they may, have, uh, they may be more like gradients across the cortex than perfectly discrete patches. I will, um, oops, I forgot what I was going to say first. Uh, first point is, first complexity is there isn't just one region for each of these selective uh, categories. There's now quite a few. They seem to be um, uh, increasing as a function of time. So in a, in a oops, in a recent paper, um, Kalanique, Real Specter, and Kevin Weiner have argued that there's three different parts of the extrastriate body area. The fusiform face area is now two different bits, and things are accumulating. Okay, so the second complexity is that actually they're not sharp edges. So I will blur them here to symbolize the fact that there's some ambiguity about the sharpness of their edges. Uh, and to acknowledge that there's some debate, which I will discuss in detail shortly, uh, about precisely how selective these regions are, I will make a token gesture by slightly desaturating my blobs. Okay, okay. so uh, let's step back for a moment and say, okay, who cares? Um, why, um, why does it matter whether the ventral pathway contains these category selective regions? Well, I'd say this question matters for a number of reasons. My favorites are, first, that I think it's just one of the most fundamental and long-standing questions we can ask about the organization of the human mind and brain. Whether we are cognitive specialists um, with minds and brains that contain highly specialized, dedicated machinery to solve very particular problems, or whether we are just generically smart, uh, able to tackle any computational problem that comes along. And so I see this question about the ventral pathway as a microcosm of that broader, um, long-standing question about mind and brain. Uh, and of course, that question has been addressed um, for at least 200 years by the famous and the uh, infamous alike. Uh, and I'd say the second reason why I, it's important to address these regions is that I think to the extent that we have special purpose machinery or patches that do very different things from each other in the ventral visual pathway, that makes possible a research strategy, which is a tried and true method in any um, any field where you're trying to understand a complex entity is to first identify its components and then try to figure out how each one works and then maybe someday, God knows if that'll ever happen here, uh, figure out how they work together. 
So I think that that can be very productive uh, here in the ventral pathway. And my third major reason is that I think just breaking the system into parts already gives us some pretty important clues about what we really want to know, which is, as, a, as perception researchers, what we want to know is what are the representations uh, that live in each of these regions and the kinds of computations that go, the particular computations that go on in each region. And just the very scope of function of each region gives us some clues. So for example, if we're making a computational model of face recognition, we'll come up with something very different if the same algorithm has to also work to, for recognition of objects, words, and scenes. And so just the scope of function already tells us a bunch about, um, about what kinds of representations and computations we might expect to find. Okay, so those are my, um, my reasons for asking these questions. And I think just finding these selective regions in the brain is just the, the very bare beginning. We barely scratched the surface and most of the uh, most important questions remain unanswered. So today I will uh, grapple with three of them. Notice I say grapple, I won't uh, answer most of these. Uh, the first one is this question of specificity. So I will uh, agonize a bit more about whether these regions really are engaged only in processing their preferred stimuli. So for example, is the fusiform face area really only engaged in processing faces or does it also do double duty um, uh, doing other things with other stimuli beyond faces? Uh, and I'd say that's important both for our understanding of vision, as I just argued. Uh, the, the scope of these regions um, gives us clues about their computations, uh, but also as a, as a test case of this broader question of the domain specificity of the machinery of mind and brain. Okay, so the second question uh, I'll address is that just as I think it's useful to carve up, to take, say, all of high-level vision or the ventral pathway and try to figure out what its pieces are, I think it's also useful now that we have a bunch of different face selective regions, a bunch of different place selective regions and so forth, I think it's useful in each of those domains to try to take them apart, figure out what those pieces are, and try to find a division of labor within each system. So I'll talk a bunch about um, some of the components of the face processing system and some preliminary clues about how the functional division of labor is allocated to different face regions. And I think that'll, that gives an important lever for understanding face perception. And in particular, I'll focus on the fusiform face area and a face selective patch in the posterior superior temporal sulcus. Uh, and finally, if I leave myself a little bit of time, I will um, speculate wildly, um, but briefly, um, about whether uh, this organization of the ventral pathway tells us anything about actual perceptual experience. And I will um, somewhat recklessly um, speculate that we can look at these maps of the brain not just as a characterization of a piece of meat, uh, but as a depiction of the representational capacity uh, we have in vision. Okay, so that's the lineup. Let's start with this question of specificity. Um, so I, I, on the one hand, I, I always wonder whether to really uh, in, engage in this discussion, because to me, the, the data seems so obvious. Um, there's such strong support for specificity. On the other hand, there's lots of disagreement. And I see this from all fronts. I think um, I'll, I'll try to caricature a, a version of it that you see in textbooks. You see it in introductions to papers in cognitive science. I see it all over the place. It goes something like this. Well, it used to be 200 years ago, we had the simple-minded view that different parts of the brain did very specific things, but now we've grown up and we're more sophisticated and we understand that cognition uh, is implemented at a complicated, interacted, distributed, every gobbledygook word we can load in here, system uh, that, you know, that we wouldn't be so um, puerile as to uh, hypothesize that, particular, that a particular region just carries out one function. So there are various versions of that going around. And every time I see one of those, I say, yes, I do still need to talk about this. Um, so I'm going to put forth the puerile view that at least for a few regions of brain, um, they're engaged in very specific functions. OK, so um, some, of the, some of the disagreement is, I think, just off point. It's conflating different issues. Um, so for example, there's a lot of discussion about innateness. And people seem to think that it's the same issue as specificity. Of course, they're totally different. The question of the developmental origins of these regions is 
hugely important, fascinating, um, and uh, I'd love to answer that question. I don't think any of us has a clue, but it's totally orthogonal to the question of whether these regions are functionally specific in a typical adult. Okay, so one way to see that orthogonality is to consider the case of the visual word form area. So um, many people have shown, here's some data from Chris Baker and others and me uh, a while ago. This is a response profile of the visual word form area to visually presented words and letter strings um, in, um, in an orthography the subjects know. And here are a bunch of orthographies they don't know, Hebrew and Chinese for non-Hebrew readers, non-Chinese readers. And you can see this region responds selectively to orthographies you know. And just to nail it, we then brought in subjects who read both English and Hebrew. And there you see that that same region now responds as the Hebrew up here strongly to uh, all of the orthographies the subjects know. So what that shows very clearly is the kind of common sense intuitive notion that the selectivity of a region, uh, you can have a very strongly selective region where that selectivity must have been learned. Okay. So two different issues. Um, second thing that's um, often conflated is people say, well, it doesn't make sense to talk about the function of this region because, of course, we know everything is connected to everything else in the brain and there's a lot of interaction uh, and other regions are um, necessarily involved. My reaction to that comment is, like, duh, um, of course everything's connected. Uh, every brain region is connected to many other regions and, of course, you, other brain regions are necessary for functions. You can't process faces or places or bodies if you don't have a retina and an LGN and a V1, and you probably can't become aware of it without a bunch of parietal and frontal regions and God knows what else. So of course other regions are necessary. So when I talk about functional specificity of a given region, I just mean that that region is doing something very specific, not that it doesn't need input or, um, or, or interactions or connections to other brain regions. Okay. Um, so those are the, what I take to be the, the not so trenchant critiques, but I think there's one challenge that's worth taking very seriously that's I think smart and, um, and still in play, um, and that is the challenge that comes from Jim Haxby's um, 2001 paper uh, in which he claimed that uh, category selective regions contain information about non-preferred stimuli. Right? By non-preferred I mean stuff like shoes and cars in the face area. Right? Okay, so in case any of you have been living in a cave for the last decade, uh, let me just briefly give you the thrust of the argument in the um, Haxby paper. It, it was both a deep theoretical claim and an important method for our field, all rolled into one paper. Um, and so schematically, the basic idea is that it's important to look at not just the mean response of a chunk of cortex, but the pattern of response across neurons or voxels or whatever we have access to in that region. And if you look in a, a region of the brain and you see that there's a distinctive, these are voxels here and magnitudes of response, and a distinctive profile of response that differs between two categories, say chairs and cars, then that region contains information about that distinction. Okay? And importantly, that can be true even if the mean response to those two conditions is very low, uh, is the same as each other, and even if the mean response is zero to both of those, you can still have a pattern of response. And so the, the kind of bite in this critique, which is important and true, is that just looking at the mean response over a whole region misses out an important um, uh, possible role of these patterns. Okay, so that's the argument. So in that original paper, Haxby et al. Uh, reported that in fact there is non-preferred information, that is an ability, information about the dis distinction between say uh, chairs and cars in the fusiform face area and in the parahippocampal place area. So they argued that regions such as the PPA and the FFA are not dedicated to representing only spatial arrangements or human faces, but rather are part of a more extended representation for all objects. Okay, so that's an important critique. When I first read that, I thought, whoa, whoops. And then I, of course, looked through it. Oh, well, they didn't localize the face area right. They didn't localize the place area right. We got to do this right. And we... Mona Spiridon and I did this, and we looked, and we didn't find that pattern information about non-preferred stimuli in those regions. Uh, and then, actually, a few years ago, um, Alice O'Toole and Jim Haxby did some further analyses of their original data and said, well, actually, um, preferred regions for faces and houses are not well suited to object classifications that do not involve faces and houses, respectively. But I don't get to gloat, because a few years after that, 
we looked again at higher resolution, and uh, yeah, now we do detect it. So, so it's been a bit of a tortured history. Uh, but I think at this point, it's really clear that if you uh, have enough statistical power, you can look in with, with standards I would totally you know, sign on to. You identify the regions the way I would endorse. There is, in fact, pattern information in each of these category selective regions that would enable you to discriminate uh, two different non-preferred stimuli for that region. So I think that's really, it's, it's much weaker than the discriminative abil ability for preferred categories, but it's significant. So I think that's important. Um, and what I'm going to argue is that the crucial question actually is not just whether there's information there, but whether that information is used. That is, is that non-preferred uh, pattern information causally involved in perception? Uh, because I think actually there's probably all kinds of pattern information all over the brain that may just arise from whatever epiphenomenal other rigmarole is going on that may not be on the causal chain for whatever um, relevant cognitive process. So I think we need to know not just is it there, but is it used. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go through three lines of evidence that actually it's not used. Um, and um, let me start with what I think is actually the most important. And this is you know, way before functional MRI came on the scene. Uh, people were testing neurological patients, and the whole import and interest and intrigue of studying neurological patients uh, is that, of course, they do not become generically worse across the board, or at least many of them do not. Many of them have very specific deficits, and that's why we study them. That's why they're interesting. They give us this beautiful ability to fractionate the system and discover its functional components. In fact, I think they do that better than functional MRI does uh, by quite a long shot. It's just harder. There are fewer of them. Um, and in fact, um, not, not so far from here, um, the, the very word prosopagnosia was coined in a paper by Bottomer um, here in Germany in a paper published in 1947. That's the, the uh, title of the paper. So this tradition goes way back. In fact, there, there were reports of prosopagnosia not by that name uh, well before this. And so my first point is I think that actually the patient literature already shows us that if you can get uh, sharp functional dissociations between these different categories, which are abundant in the literature, we already know to some extent that uh, the non-preferred information is not playing a causal role. Um, and I would say this is arguably stronger than any data from functional MRI. However, as I mentioned, of course, the clean cases are rare. There's no reason for brain damage to respect the functional borders of the ventral visual pathway. Um, and so um, it would be nice to have, and, and actually I always wonder whether it's possible that, um, that the patients who uh, we get to study are the very rare ones where there's some fractionation and maybe they're actually not typical. Uh, of brain damage patients. So I think the, the more modern efforts of looking, in fact, Kathleen told me she's doing this, uh, of looking at uh, patients selected by the location of their lesion uh, is an important um, addition to this long tradition. Okay, but of course the other thing we can do, as Kathleen mentioned, is use TMS. Uh, and actually I think the most exciting paper um, to me in this line of work I had nothing to do with, and that was a paper by David Pitcher published in 2009, where he used the BrainSight brain um, guidance system, uh, works much better than tattoos, um, and he used it to position the TMS coil over three regions that were very close to each other in the ventral visual pathway, and he showed a triple dissociation um, in the um, deficits that uh, was produced by the TMS. I found that so astonishing and spectacular that I invited him to join my lab as a postdoc, uh, set up those methods, and first order of business, let's replicate those results. So here's our replication of his earlier result. Uh, we started off looking at face perception and body perception. So we had a simple task, a uh, delayed match to sample with about uh, a second in between. A first face comes on, and then we used more faces. A, uh, another face that's either identical or slightly different, and it's just the same different task, same deal with bodies. And the question is, how is performance affected when you zap different parts of the brain? So we start by um, zapping the, uh, the vertex on the top of the head as a control region. And this just shows you that our uh, accuracy is a little over 80%, nice dynamic range when you're targeting a region that uh, shouldn't have an effect here. Okay, compared to that, if we move the coil over and target the occipital face area, which is out on the lateral surface, 
uh, what we see is a small but very significant, um, so, sorry, I said the occipital face area, the extrastriate body area, we get a small uh, but significant drop in performance in body perception, but crucially, no effect on face perception. But it's not just that our face perception task is too robust to be disrupted, because if we move the coil over and zap the occipital face area, we see the opposite, a disruption in face perception and no disruption in body perception. So these data argue that even if there's pattern information about other things, the occipital face area is causally involved in the perception of faces, not bodies, and the extrastriate body area is causally involved in the perception of bodies, not faces. Okay, replicating David's earlier result. More recently, Danny Dilks and I and others uh, have targeted um, the occipital face area and another scene selective region, a little hard to see up here, um, called the occipital place area. Um, again, the reason that we're going for these, the, the OFA and the, uh, sorry, the OFA and the OPA rather than the fusiform face area and the parahippocampal place area, of course, we'd love to zap those regions. The trouble is they're too medial to reach with TMS. Of course, the first thing I did when I got a TMS coil 10 plus years ago was stick it right there, tar trying to target the FFA, crank it to the max, and try to make myself prosopagnosic, uh, but it didn't work. And many people have tried it since. It doesn't work because the TMS just uh, doesn't reach far enough. So we go for the closest thing we can, which are these other um, category selective regions that are on the lateral surface. That's why we're talking about these. Okay, so in this task, we used a minor variant. We used a nice psychophysical procedure where we, um, a stimulus comes on, a little scene here, and then immediately thereafter you have a choice of two and you have to say which one matches the previous one. Uh, and we use a um, staircase procedure to move these stimuli along in morph space. Here we have a morph between Franz and somebody else, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, we uh, move these at different distances in morph space and we ask how far apart they need to be in morph space to enable you to do this task with 75% accuracy. Okay, so that's our dependent measure. And we do the whole staircase procedure while zapping one of those regions. Okay, so our dependent measure, um, first let's look at the occipital face area. So now what you see is compared to um, our control vertex region in gray, you see, remember, it's threshold, so up is bad. Threshold goes up for the face discrimination task when you zap the OFA. Uh, but when you move the coil over to the occipital place area, um, face uh, performance is unaffected, and we get a si significant increase in threshold for this scene discrimination task here. Again, same deal, showing that the occipital face area is causally involved in the perception of faces, not scenes, and the OPA is, is causally involved in the perception of scenes, not faces. So I take these data to argue that even if there is non-preferred information, as Haxby and others have shown in each of those regions, it's apparently not causally involved in the perception of those non-preferred stimuli, at least not that we can detect here with TMS. Okay, now as I mentioned, it would be really lovely to uh, zap the other uh, medial regions, which are even more selective and about which more is known uh, than these slightly marginal lateral uh, regions. Um, and you can't do that with TMS, um, but I can't resist showing you briefly some data that, again, I have nothing to do with. I'm just thrilled about these data. This is a recent paper by Joseph Parvizi and Colony Girl Specter at Stanford. And Parvizi is a neurologist, and so he's been collecting intracranial recordings of patients who have electrodes along the surface of the brain being mapped out before epilepsy surgery. And so collaborating with Kalanit, they had one patient where she scanned the subject with functional MRI. This is a, a ventral surface of the fusiform gyrus, the, the occipital pole, temporal lobe going along here. And so here is, in this subject, the two little parts of the fusiform face area. And by chance, in this patient, the electrodes, which are placed by the surgeon, two of them landed right on top of those little black outlines, those two parts of the fusiform face area. Okay, so not only did they record the responses, uh, in that region, but in the most amazing part, they use the full power of causal testing uh, to look at uh, what happens when you stimulate that region. Okay, so again, this is not my data. It's just so cool, I have to share it with you. Um, so um, I'm gonna show you just a, a minute or so of videotape of this patient whose head is all bandaged because he's got electrodes along the surface of his brain. And you can watch this yourself. It's 
the paper's published in Journal of Neuroscience and the movie's downloadable. Um, and so what we're gonna see is what happens when the neurologist says, look at my face and tell me what you see. Um, so here we go. So this is Parvizi talking in a second. Okay, just look at my face Oops. and tell me what happens when I do this, Sorry all right? That. Uh, I don't know how to get this thing to show up on the screen. Um, okay, I gotta tell you, what, sorry about this. Let's listen to the audio for just a second here and then I can do the video later. I think it's not worth fixing online here. Sorry, I didn't think to test this. So listen. One, two, this three. This jam stimulation. Nothing. Nothing? Patient okay. says nothing. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at my face. One, two. Four milliamps. Three. Listen. You just turn into somebody else. Tell me. Your about. face metamorphosed. Your nose got saggy, you went to the left. You almost look like somebody I'd seen before, but somebody different. That was a trip. Okay, so I'm sorry the video didn't work, but you got the gist of it. So what this um, shows um, is a strong causal test. When you stimulate that part of the brain, um, in this case, the, the guy was looking at uh, Parvizi's face and it made a total uh, distortion of his face. The guy had no idea that the electrodes were on top of his fusiform face area. He had no idea uh, what to expect. That's why he was so shocked and he says that was a trip. Right? In subsequent uh, stimulations, they tested, uh, they stimulated him while he was looking at other kinds of objects and they didn't see much of any disruption. And so the data are very limited in these cases. One would want to have much more, but to the degree that we can draw inferences from cases like this, um, I think it's very strong evidence for the very specific causal role of that region only in face perception, not in the perception of other stimuli. Okay. Um, okay, so all of that was uh, saying, uh, are these regions really only uh, engaged in processing their preferred stimuli? And I would say yes, the current evidence is really consistent with that. There's pattern information about other stimuli, but so far as we can tell so far, um, the, um, that pattern information appears to be epiphenomenal in the sense that it's not causally involved in perception. Okay. And I would say that conclusion is important both for our understanding of the organization of vision and as um, evidence for the domain specificity of at least some parts of mind and brain. Okay, so let's tackle this next question, the functional divisions of labor. As I mentioned before, it's useful to look within the face system to see its parts. Uh, and in fact, we'd expect to see um, some subdivision within the face system because faces are just an enormously rich uh, biological stimulus that are laden with all different kinds of information. It's not just a business of telling who that person is or their gender or age or race or even where they're looking or what emotional expression they're having on their face. There's so much more we see in a face. I think faces provide rich social technicolor. We can see all kinds of stuff. We can get glimmers about whether the person is truthful or lying. We can see in an emotional expression, not just if the person's happy or sad, but if they're complacent or condescending or conspiratorial or any of hundreds or thousands of other very nuanced, rich, multidimensional kinds of information we can extract from a face. So given this multiplicity of information um, that we get from faces, um, we want to know which of this information is processed in each region um, and whether there's a division of labor in this, this big universe of the information you get from a face. Okay, and now I've overblown it. I'm not going to answer any of this. I'm just saying why I think it's important. We're going to give you a few little clues from three lines of evidence for dissociations between the fusiform face area and the uh, face region in the SDS. Okay, so first to orient us, uh, this is now real data, it's thresholded, but here are three subjects uh, showing you um, all of their selective regions identified here. But most relevant for now, uh, here's the fusiform face area on the ventral surface in three subjects. Here's one with the two FFAs that colony has been talking about. This guy has one and who knows, maybe that would turn into two if you took your threshold up. Uh, and the other region we'll be talking about is this face selective region on the lateral surface uh, in the spiritemporal sulcus. Okay, so, um, so the question is, do these regions do different things, and if so, what is that division of labor?
So this story, like many in science, begins with a, um, uh, a case of serendipity. Um, a bunch of years ago, Rebecca Sachs and I decided to try to scan kids, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, it's harder than uh, we ever guessed. But Rebecca had the smart idea that kids wouldn't want to lie in the scanner and look at our boring grayscale static images that we use to localize these regions in adults, and so we better keep their attention by giving them very nice stimuli. So we brought in a, um, a, a camera person, and we got our friends to bring their kids in. This is John Gabrielli's daughter, Christina. Uh, and we shot uh, nice little movies of uh, kids' faces, uh, or bodies, feet and elbows and knees and stuff, uh, or dynamic movies of objects like this. So we basically were just making um, a localizer um, like, our, um, like we've been using before, except we were using nice colored movies instead of, you know, to engage the kids. And I didn't expect this would make any difference, but we thought we'd better check, so we scanned a few adults on these localizers and we found all of our usual regions just fine, comparing these faces to objects. It works just great. Find the scene selective areas, body selective areas, so forth. Um, uh, but there was one surprise. And that is, for the first time, we saw that face selective region in the STS light up like mad. And I actually hadn't seen it much before, and I hadn't studied it much because I couldn't find it reliably. It was so weak, and as I mentioned, I don't like wimpy areas, so I didn't pay much attention to it. But with our movies, it was just really robust. So the first thing we did was to say, okay, is that, is that a real result? So David Pitcher had just joined my lab and needed an easy functional MRI experiment. So I said, okay, find out if that's really true. Show them three second movie clips of each of those stimuli versus make three one second stills from each movie clip. And let's compare the response in each region to the movies versus the stills. Okay, the stills are actually presented in the same order, they're from the same movies, they're very similar. Um, and indeed, the fusiform face area doesn't care at all. Here's its response magnitude to faces, bodies, scenes, object, and scrambled stimuli. The movies are in black and the static stimuli are in white. It just doesn't care. Movies, stills, it's all the same. Show me a face, I'll turn on. Okay? But here's the surprise, at least to us. Um, the face selective region in the spiritemporal sulcus cares deeply about whether it's looking at movies or stills. Um, it responds um, three times as strongly to movies of faces as to stills of faces. That's why we never saw it before. We were trying to compare this to that, and that's, those are tiny effect sizes. So in fact, um, this wasn't really a new discovery. There were many prior papers that published similar results and that talked about how dynamic face information was important to, for the STS. So I'm not touting it as our discovery. It's just somehow when you see such a huge effect size in your own data, it catches your attention. So it certainly caught mine. And the first thing it tells us is that these regions are doing really important things, importantly different things. Um, and the second thing it, 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 it forces is it really makes you think, what is it you can do with a three second movie clip of a face that you can't do with three one second stills in the same order from the same movie clip? Tempting um, hypotheses like, oh, you know, the usual ones that have been implied to this region, gaze direction discrimination, emotional expression, well, they're there in the stills too. So it's something subtler than that. It's something about how those things change over time. I don't know the answer, but I think it's really intriguing. Okay, so that's our first clue that, that these two regions are dissociated. Um, the second clue comes from autism. So I need to take a little bit of a sidebar about autism, as I'm sure you guys know. Uh, the defining feature of the cognitive phenotype of autism is a deficit in social cognition. Um, less well known is that although everybody talks about face recognition deficits in autism, um, and although there are some face recognition uh, deficits in daily life and in the standard test batteries, actually, uh, if you look carefully, as Sarah Weigelt, then a postdoc in my lab, did at the entire literature, huge, huge task, uh, in fact, if you look at the perceptual discrimination tasks on faces, there isn't really evidence for a deficit on just the basic business of discriminating face identity in autism. There does seem to be a deficit from her lit review on uh, face memory and on other higher level social perception tasks, but not on face identity perception per se. So that's a lit review. We decided to test this in the lab. And so we used our beloved uh, 
morphing staircase procedure. So we tested um, kids on this task with faces. You see one and you have to say which of those two matches the immediately preceding one. And we use a staircase and again the dependent measure is how far apart do these things need to be in morph space to um, uh, enable you to discriminate them, 75% correct. Um, so here's our data. We do find um, in the uh, kids with autism in black, we do find a significant deficit in the body discrimination task along here, um, but this uh, difference in faces is not even close to significant, and this is a large sample of 50 kids with autism, 50 typical kids. Maybe if you tested 500, that teeny effect would be significant, but it's small or non-existent. There just isn't much of a deficit in basic face discrimination. Uh, in ongoing uh, work on adults with autism, Alex Kell and Cami Coldwin and I uh, are running the same task, and again, we find no deficit uh, in basic face discrimination uh, in people with autism. These are all high-functioning people with autism, I should say. Okay, so given this, um, are the data we've collected in my lab fit with the results of Sarah's lit review, uh, and that gives us some possible predictions for what we might see in the fusiform face area in the STS. In particular, if the fusiform face area conducts very basic face perception, uh, as I and many people have argued, um, um, whereas the superior temporal sulcus does some higher level kind of social perception, um, then we should predict that the fusiform face area might be normal in people with autism, whereas the superior temporal sulcus face region might be affected. Okay? So that's a prediction. So we tested it by scanning, in this case, 15 adults with autism, 31 typical subjects on our same dynamic localizer. We use the movies because, of course, you need them to really see that superior temporal sulcus uh, region well. Okay, so here's what we find. The face area looks pretty much exactly the same in the typicals in volumes, the volume of the FFA, identify it in each subject individually, and then just um, look at the mean volume across uh, groups. Um, you know, there's a teeny tiny trend, but it's very far from significance. Um, there's just no real indication that the FFA is affected uh, in autism. However, if you look in the face selective region in the STS, it's much smaller uh, in the adults with autism than the typical subjects. So I think that's, uh, uh, and the interaction by uh, group by region is very significant. We're running more subjects because 15 seems small to me, but we already have the result here statistically. Um, so that con confirms our prediction um, that the FFA is um, normal in volume in ASD, but the posterior superior temporal sulcus region is affected. And I think that gives us a clue about autism and its nature, uh, but it also gives our, gives our second data point in dissociating these two regions, the FFA and the PSTS. Namely, FFA is unaffected in autism, uh, at least by this measure, whereas the PSDS is strongly affected. It's reduced by less than half. Okay. Uh, the third test of a dissociation between these regions, uh, it's perhaps uh, reckless for me to even talk about this for reasons you'll see in a second, um, and that is whether, whether we see differential development of these the two regions in typical kids. Um, and first, some background. Uh, there's actually a lot of work on the development of the fusiform face area. Many papers have argued that the FFA develops very slowly, in continuing to increase in size after age five, in some papers well into adolescence, still increasing in size. And all of that seems very strange to me. It's strange because the behavioral literature is very clear that all of the key signatures of face-specific processing are present at the earliest ages they've ever been tested, always by age four, often by age one day. So why would the region that we think is doing these computations, why would it continue to change years after the basic system is already in place? Um, so we figured there are many challenges in scanning children, so even though many of these studies are done very nicely, um, uh, we figured it was worth another look, and so we asked, does the fusiform face area really change substantially after age five? Uh, and do we see differential development of the FFA and the um, uh, region in STS? I reiterate, scanning children is really difficult, and the reason it's really difficult is they move much more than adults, and everyone knows this. We knew it before we got into it, but we didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> 
So this is work with Danny Dilks. Uh, we've been at it for five years. Uh, we've done everything imaginable to try to get the kids to hold still. They get training in a mock scanner. They're watching movies that stop when they move. We give them videotapes before they even come into the lab. They come in for multiple sessions. We do everything we can think of. We have head coils that hold their heads, that are designed to fit around a kid's head that hold their head still better than the typical kids. And even so, this is a scatter plot of the amount of rotational head motion, that's motion in this axis here, um, for kids. These are the 80 kids we've scanned over the last five years. Uh, and these are uh, 40 or 50 adults. Uh, it's hard to see. All the adults are down there near zero head motion, and as you can see, the kids are all over the place. Um, now, you might say, well, who cares? A little bit of head motion, so what? Uh, that's an empirical question. We looked in adults at the volume of the fusiform face area um, in adults as a function of this amount of rotational head motion. And you can see that when the head motion gets larger, even though we're only sampling in this restricted range here with the adults, FFA volumes are lower. And it's even worse for the face selective region in the STS. Once you get over a very low bar, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's not surprising, your data quality are lousy, and so you have lower significance, and you can't detect these regions. So this is a serious problem. We haven't solved it. That's why after working on this for five years, we still haven't published anything. But I thought I'd show you the little teeny bit of data we have, which is, okay, we can see here where, where the data start getting bad. Let's just draw our threshold there, and let's take whatever kids from the youngest group are down there and compare them to adults. Sadly, that's only five kids age five and six. That's why it's a little reckless for me to talk about this. And these data are very tentative, but I'll show them anyway. Um, okay, what do we see in the FFA? No difference between adults and kids in volume of the FFA um, of the kids who don't move much. Now, you might say, well, we're selecting such a special group of kids. Maybe everything in their brain looks adult-like. So what about the PSTS? No. Huge difference in volume of the PSTS. And when we do all the controls to measure the temporal signal to noise in each of these regions of the brain, they're exactly matched across kids and adults. So our data quality are the same, as well as on you know, five different dimensions that we can think of to match. Uh, and as far as we can tell, in this admittedly tiny group, the FFAs are not different, and the STS is wildly different, already very significantly different between kids and adults. So I don't want to say there's never, ever going to be a difference in the FFA between kids and adults. There could be when we test more, but I don't think it's a big difference. I don't think it's the threefold difference in volume that some studies have claimed. I think it's subtle, and I think, crucially, the real action developmentally is happening elsewhere. It's happening in the STS, not in the FFA. So this gives us our very tentative uh, third dissociation between the FFA and the STS, which is the FFA is very approximately adult-like by age 5-6, uh, whereas the face selective region in the PSTS is not. Okay, so I started with this question about the dissociation of these regions, uh, and I, I would say clearly they're functionally distinct. Um, and what it looks like is that the FFA is really involved in basic static perception of faces, uh, perhaps primarily uh, identity, that it's preserved in autism and that it develops early. Whereas the face selective region in the STS seems to be involved in some much higher level kind of social perception. Uh, it's impaired in autism and it develops late. Now, of course, crucially, what we really want to know is what exactly is that STS region engaged in? We're doing lots of studies right now. None of them we're quite ready to talk about. We don't have a good answer yet, but I think I can't imagine a boring answer to this question. So I think, uh, I think it will be fun to find out. Um, and now I need to figure out if I have time for a little uh, sidebar. Kathleen, she was going to tell me when I need to. OK. Oh, good, 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 good. OK. So I don't really ha this this next piece of data is um, is uh, not perfectly integrated with the talk, but it's cool, so I thought I'd throw it in. My, my feeble segue is another region, reason to suspect that this um, face selective region in the PSDS is doing some very interesting high-level social thing is that there's lots of other interesting high-level social stuff in that neighborhood of the cortex. So many people have reported cool, interesting things that go on in that region. And we don't really know what proximity means in the brain, so it's kind of a feeble argument, uh, but I'm going to show you um, an intriguing recent result from Cami Coldwin, um, who was asking a different question and finding an activation right next door to that face region, in fact, slightly overlapping with it. 
So she asked whether we have uh, typical adults now, whether we have specialized brain machinery for perceiving social interactions. Okay? So she used some point light stimuli uh, from a prior paper, um, and she used those because they afford really nice, as many people, I don't need to tell this audience, point light um, uh, biological motion stimuli afford very nice control over the low level properties of your stimulus. Um, and so what we showed is brief clips um, from this previous study uh, that show very simple social interactions. They're pretty rudimentary, there's not much to them. Um, but if you just watch on the top here, you can see what happens. Okay, I don't know if you got that. One guy just beckons and the other guy stands up. So here it goes again. Okay, so it's just a few seconds. It's not deep, but it's the basic uh, exchange of information. It's an interaction between two people. So we then wanted, as a, the tightest control we could think of, we took these two people who are facing each other like this and interacting, and we cut the video and moved them like that so they're facing away, and then we drew a vertical line uh, to help enhance the percept that they are, they are not interacting, so that creates this kind of stimulus. Okay, so that disrupts the percept of a social interaction. I don't think it obliterates it, because you could still imagine, well, maybe there's some mirror, or they're somehow communicating, because there's still the time sinking of their behavior. So we added a third condition to be sure that we could really just, you know, obliterate the, um, the percept of a social interaction. We got point light walkers of people engaged in unrelated activities on either sides of a white line like this. Okay, so I think, you know, you just aren't tempted to construe that as a social interaction by any stretch of the imagination. It's not as tightly matched as our top condition, but at least it, it nails the uh, getting rid of the perceptive interaction. So Cami asked uh, whether there are brain regions that are perhaps selectively involved in perceiving social interactions. And to, to get a first look at that, she contrasted uh, people looking at this top condition, the interaction condition, versus the bottom condition, the independent activities, uh, activities condition. And she just looked in each subject at whether you got systematic uh, activations in that contrast. Uh, and yes, indeed, in 18 out of 20 subjects, she's got a pretty similar activation here, five of them here, right in the spiritemporal sulcus, right next door, and indeed slightly overlapping with that, um, that face region up in the spiritemporal sulcus, responding more to the social interaction than the independent um, uh, activities. So that's promising, um, but I never get that excited when I just see a blob in the brain. I want to see a, a response profile of exactly what it's doing and exactly how selective is it. Um, so here's our data. So this is now, you take some of the data to define the region, uh, and you look at the left out data. So these are independent data showing you how that region responds without any selection bias. Uh, and what you see is here's the response of that region uh, when you look at the social interactions, here's the independent activities, and here's the, tight, the tightly controlled uh, mirrored activities with the same stimuli. So we found that pretty compelling and pretty fun. Um, and I would say that's quite selective. Um, and the first question is, well, what is its relationship to that face region that I've been talking about that's up in the superior temporal sulcus? Uh, and the simple way to answer that is to look in the same region at the response to the key conditions there that I showed you before, the movies of faces, uh, body parts, and objects, and the response is very low to all of those. So it's right next door, but clearly distinct from that face region, okay? And that also shows us that it's not just responding when things are interesting. I think, you know, you might tell a story about how those are less interesting than this, but they're plenty interesting, and these are, these are very interesting. I just, I don't think this is just an attentional confound. Uh, further, we can ask, how do, is it, does this region dissociate from other known regions? Um, so what about the extra striate body area that's out on the lateral surface of the brain? Here's what it does. Um, it, it's the, the EBA is maybe a little bit inferior to that uh, interaction region, a little bit below. And you can see it responds strongly to all of these conditions, because after all, it likes bodies, and there's bodies present in all of these. So it just responds to the presence of bodies whether in point light walkers, as has been shown before, or videos of you know, feet and hands moving uh, much more than dynamic faces or objects. So it's behaving just like it ought, and it doesn't care about social interactions uh, in particular. And finally, uh, what about the fusiform face area? 
I've been sort of asserting that it really is just doing bare bones um, uh, perception of basic face structure, but there are quite a few papers where people argue that it's actually doing higher level social stuff. Um, I have issues with many of those studies, but of course it's an empirical question. We can ask here, what does the FFA do with these stimuli? Answer, it doesn't care about the high level social information and the social interactions, it responds the same to all of these conditions here in the point light stimuli, and it replicates its usual stronger response to faces than anything else. So this is early days in this investigation. We're doing a lot of other conditions now, testing uh, whether this region responds to uh, social interactions in static images um, and in, um, uh, in um, animated shapes that are interacting but that don't look like people. So far, it looks like the response is much lower in both of those, but we're looking at them now. Um, and again, we don't feel like we've nailed what this region does, but I think it's hard to imagine a, a trivial explanation of it. Whatever it ends up doing, I think will be uh, fun and informative. Okay, so all that was to, um, to say that uh, in addition to this division of labor between the FFA and the uh, face selective region and the STS, next to that STS face region um, are a bunch of other interesting high level social perceptual regions of which I've just shown you one. Um, and actually I think that's just a fascinating part of the brain. We're doing lots of experiments now trying to understand how that whole zone is organized. Um, as, a, as a sidebar, there have been some recent claims in review articles arguing that uh, actually there's not really any um, division of labor within the superior temporal sulcus. But those studies are based on group analyses and meta-analyses that drastically blur the functional profiles. So what we're doing now is these kind of crazy experiments where you scan subjects on for like four or more different scanning sessions of two hours apiece so that in the same subject, you have you know, several dozen different conditions and you can really ask in a fine-grained way without the blurring that happens across subjects uh, whether which of these um, high-level social perceptual functions are on top of each other and which are distinct. Okay, um, so my last question. What does any of this have to do with perception? I'm originally trained as a psychologist. I actually care more about perception than about physical stuff like brains and it would be very nice if we could uh, actually say something about perception based on uh, what we've learned about the organization of the ventral pathway. Um, I, I think this is, a, this is sort of a wild speculation, but let me just give it a whirl in closing. So let me start with a paradox that will be familiar to most of you. In fact, probably most of you know this literature better than I do. And that is the paradox that most of the recent literature from, say, the last 15 years suggests that actually visual perception is, is very sparse and impoverished. I'm talking about all the work on the capacity of visual working memory, uh, where the argument originally was that you could only encode four things, whether those are features or objects or what. It was a matter of debate, and now maybe it's not exactly four, maybe it depends on this and that, but in any case, it's not much, right? Um, and also, the whole change blindness paradigm, which um, shows very strikingly that even when very interesting stuff is right in front of you, you often just totally miss it. Again, supposedly because of this very restricted kind of bandwidth of perception, we can really only see a little bit of stuff at a time. So I think that whole view that's, that's been very kind of salient in a whole big uh, part of the field, to me, just seems very odd because it just fights with my subjective impression. I just, every time I read those results, I'll say, well, maybe your percepts are sparse, but mine are rich. They're full of information. There's so much stuff in there. Um, and of course, we can be fooled by our subjective impressions, but I think they're, it's worth listening to subjective impressions. Sometimes they're informative. Uh, and beyond subjective impressions, there's, there's, there's data, right? So for example, the elegant work from Molly Potter going back decades, but especially the stuff she's done in the last couple years. Molly's my intellectual mommy, so I'm biased, but I think her recent stuff is incredibly cool. She's so, shown recently that if you flash up, say, six, um, novel, complex, real-world scenes for one or two screen refreshes apiece, much faster than the earlier work on RSVP. You flash them up, six scenes back-to-back -back at one or two refreshes apiece, and then at the end, you ask a question like, was there a picnic or a wedding or something with a very 
abstract, high-level gist. Um, subjects are way above chance at that. Um, and you know, are they doing that from detecting four objects? Uh, maybe, but it doesn't seem like it to me. Okay, so I think there's a paradox between the most of the literature that suggests that we have this very sparse bandwidth of uh, perceptual experience and perceptual representational capacity versus subjective impression in some data that suggests that there must be much more than that going on. So I think part, there are various things that can be said about this. Uh, one is the lovely um, recent work on summary statistics, which uh, shows that you can efficiently characterize an overall array statistically by the proportion of different kinds of features and things like that. And certainly that must be part of the answer to how we have a, um, a, rich, uh, a richer subjective percept than could be captured by, say, four objects. Uh, but I want to throw out another suggestion, and that is that it's time for this whole literature, which is preceded essentially completely divorced from cognitive neuroscience of vision, to start, these literatures need to start talking to each other. Um, and actually, this insight comes not so much from me, uh, but from um, a grad student at Harvard named Michael Cohen, who's doing some really cool work I'll tell you about in a second. Um, and it's really, it's really his insight that we need to look at the this, this structure. Um, I, I'm going a little beyond what he says, so don't blame him for any of my reckless claims. What I would say is we need to look at this organization here as sort of showing us, in a sense, a kind of depiction of the organization of perceptual experience, of the capa visual capacity. Uh, and what it seems to show is that why should we have one homogeneous kind of visual capacity? You look at that and you don't see one thing, you see a bunch of things. Instead, what you, what you would guess if you looked at this and brought these literatures together is that we should have multiple distinct capacities for different categories of objects. So that's Michael Cohen's key insight. Uh, and again, I don't I have anything to do with this, I just think it's important uh, and cool. So what he has done is to test that behaviorally, um, uh, this idea that we have distinct um, uh, representational capacities for different categories of objects. And so what he's done is shown what he calls a mixed category benefit. Um, and so what this means is basically if you do your standard visual working memory paradigm, and he's taken it far beyond, I'll just tell you the bare bones. You, take, you do your standard visual working memory paradigm, like a Steve Luck kind of experiment. You present four stimuli at a time, and then you probe one of them, and was this the one you saw? People perform much better at that task if the four stimuli are two faces and two scenes than if it's four faces or four scenes um, and all the other various combinations of categories like that. So the basic idea is that if you spread your representational requirements over two different pools for different categories, you do much better than if you try to stick them all in one. Um, and that's exactly what you'd predict if you took this kind of map of the brain seriously as representing something about the structure of our visual representational capacity. Okay, so that's Michael's result. There are actually some other somewhat related results. So a bunch of years ago, Lila Reddy and I used pattern analysis of the ventral pathway and showed that in clutter, namely when two objects are present, that even in the face of clutter, you can look at the pattern of response across the ventral pathway and tell if one of the objects is a face or a scene, okay? But you can't do very well if you have to tell if one is a car or a shoe. And the idea is, well, we have these special chunks of cortex that are like a private little uh, representational structure for faces and scenes and bodies. And so it doesn't matter if we plunk down a lot of other cluttery other objects in our visual percepts. Those are largely in non-overlapping parts of the brain. They don't produce that much crosstalk on top of your face and scene regions. And that's what we showed with MVPA. Um, and so again, that's consistent with the idea that um, these pools are somewhat independent of each other. Okay, um, uh, and finally, in a uh, paper that's uh, just now in press with Wan Muk Shim and Yu Hong Zhang, uh, we looked at um, um, a bunch of things, but I think some of our data speak to the representational bandwidth uh, within each category. So uh, what we did was to scan people while they're fixating at a dot actually doing a demanding task at the fovea. Uh, and then we have four faces or four scenes or four objects come up around that dot. Um, and either the four faces or four scenes are identical to each other, it's just cut, cut and paste, the very same image, or they're four different faces or four different scenes. 
And if you just look at the magnitude of response in the fusiform face area, it's no higher. In fact, it's significantly slightly less for four different faces than four identical faces. And the same for four different scenes versus four identical scenes in the PPA. And while I think there are a bunch of possible interpretations of that result, the one that naturally comes to mind is that the FFA and the PPA and also LO are really designed to represent pretty much one or maybe two things at a time. Um, they really aren't well, well designed to, to represent many different objects at once. So all of that suggests um, that, um, that, that we have both uh, uh, separate pools for different categories of objects, um, and that it kind of increases our representational capacity, but we also have limited uh, representational bandwidth within each of those pools. So I think that's what I just said. Representational capacity of visual perception is composed of multiple pools for different categories, each limited uh, and mirroring, mirroring the functional organization of the ventral visual pathway. Okay, so um, I will just end by um, saying there's a million other fascinating, big, unanswered oops, questions about the ventral pathway, and I will uh, leave them up here to acknowledge that there's plenty more to be done and we've barely scratched the surface. Thank you. I am happy to take questions. So. I don't know if I've stupefied you or. <laughs> There's a question over here. Does it? Yeah, yeah, no, it works. Okay, uh, I think we have. First of all, thank you very much. It's even much better to listen to a talk to you. It was correct decision, and we have talks, and I think you can manage it from the stage. And okay, yeah. great. There's a question down here. Go ahead. Do you want to take a microphone over there? Or? Yeah. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, I especially like the uh, um, TMS results, and you showed that there are significant but relatively small effects. Have you ever tried to uh, stimulate both sides simultaneously to get larger effects? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess everybody heard it from the microphone, but the question is what, the, the, it's frustrating that the TMS effects are so small in effect size. I agree. It would be lovely if we could, you know, make people prosopagnosic for a half a second. That would be great. Um, I've never, the suggestion was to stimulate both sides at the same time. I've never tried that. It makes me nervous. I don't really know about epilepsy and how you cause it and all that. I'm not sure it's a risk, but it makes me a little nervous. I don't know. Are, do you know of other people who've tried that? Is that something that's safe to do? You don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would, it would be lovely to have stronger effects with TMS. The risk always is you don't want to, you know, who knows what it does. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have produced any problems yet. I mean, certainly if it was going to do anything, I would know about it first, or I'd be one of the first few to know, uh, or maybe my friends would be one of the first few to know. <laughs> um, but um, I'm nervous cranking things farther. Other questions? Right there. Uh, hi, Nancy. Uh, I wonder what's your opinion about uh, the differences between the left and the right FFAs. Uh, fr from my own experience, uh, the right FFA is always highly reliable, uh, but somehow the left FFA appears to be a little bit le less so, at, at least uh, varies across different individuals. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, both the left and the right PPAs are highly reliable, doesn't seem to differ very much from each other. Uh, so I also wonder, uh, what do you think if the functions of the left and the right PPAs are uh, uh, maybe symmetrical and uh, unlike the left and right FFAs? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure I have a satisfying answer. Um, I, I have sort of uh, left neglect for the <laughs> left FFA myself. I tend to ignore it because it's, you know, some subjects don't have it and it's less selective and it's kind of shrimpy. Um, and so I don't pay as much attention to it, but um, um, we do have one result in our lab. I guess I'm not entitled to talk about it. We have one really nice dissociation between left and right FFA that we have to follow up with further studies. But, but there are not very many. I mean, I, maybe somebody, if somebody has a, uh, a result where they've got a nice fractionation of the left and right FFA, I'd love to hear about it. Mostly in my hands, it's just a wimpier version of the same thing. So 
Anybody want to tell us about their cool left FFA results? <laughs> oh, there's, I don't know if that's a question or a cool left FFA. Cool. Uh, thank you. I want to ask about multivoxel pattern analysis. Uh, how many classes are, were there in your research and how did you test their significance? How many clusters? Classes. Classes. Cl categories. Yeah. On well, average. Yeah, I'm sort of low tech and backwards. So I like multiple voxel pattern analysis. I think it can be hugely informative, but I don't do the fanciest stuff. I mean, I think the, the real wizard who does the most beautiful MVPA is um, Nico Kriegescourt. I don't know if he's around, but um, I mean, read his papers, they're beautifully written, the figures are breathtaking. He's the guy who really knows how to do it. But, but the, the, the simple stuff that I do, I like the original low-tech version from Haxby et al. 2001, where you just ask whether the correlation within a category, uh, but, but in split halves within a category, is higher than the correlation between categories. And I like that because I'm not a mathematician and I can understand it. Um, and it seems like a nice, simple representation of just how similar are these patterns in the brain, right? It's just a correlation. So I like that. It's intuitive and it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, I like it. Um, the linear support vector machines, which are probably the, you know, the equally popular, if not more so, um, I think they're fine. I think they're strong. Um, it worries me a little bit because in principle you can have one voxel that has really strong information and you can get very high performance with, a, with an SVM. And that bugs me a little bit, because is that really a characterization of what the region is doing if one voxel in that region discriminates? So I, so I tend to lean a little bit more on the um, correlation method than the, than the SVM method. Um, but ideally, we do both, and you get the same answer, and then you don't have to worry about it. But your question was, how many classes? Um, I guess it depends, on, it depends on your taste and your question. So um, one of the problems with MVPA, I find, is that for some parts of the brain, it's very robust and you can really see much higher correlations within a category than between. Like if you look at, I don't know, shoes and cars in LO, you'll get a really nice difference in the correlation of patterns. I haven't done exactly that, but similar stuff. Um, but sometimes it can be really disappointing. So about five or six years ago, um, Lila Reddy, whose picture was just up here, um, and, um, and another student and I um, got all, it was early days of MVPA and we thought this is great, we're gonna, we're gonna go in and we're gonna look at the FFA and we're gonna actually characterize what the damn thing represents. You know, we're gonna look at all these discriminations and, and see the information in there because you know, Hexby's right, it's information we should care about, not activation. So I was totally on board with that. But I kind of took the wind out of my sails. The first studies we did, we scanned one sub, one, uh, in one study we scanned um, five or six subjects with one millimeter voxels, huge amounts of statistical power, two conditions, just looking at pictures of Harrison Ford or Julia Roberts. Okay, lots of different pictures of each, but we wanted something where we had lots of different stimuli, um, but with a distinction that should be captured if you have gender information, age information, any, any you know, identity information, any of that should have been captured and in you know, we, we were just n not above chance. 50% correct with two hours of data, two classes, just looking in the right FFA. Now, maybe that's a, you know, maybe that's a disappointing statement about the FFA. Certainly, the, the work that, you know, Ode Oliva and Chris Baker and lots of other people have done in the PPA, you can see much more with pattern analysis in the PPA. Um, I don't know, maybe because it's bigger or maybe, you know, who knows why. So, I think, you know, how many classes you test depend on depends on what you want to see and how much power is there. And in my experience, I sort of stopped for a bunch of years after that. There was another study where we looked at uh, gender and race and couldn't decode either. Also with you know, one millimeter voxels, huge amounts of power. And I just got so dispirited by that that we gave up for a while. We're going to try again. Um, various people are publishing results. There's a recent paper from, um, I forget his name, at Harvard. Uh, showing discrimination of, I believe, uh, gender and race in the FFA with MVPA. Exactly what they did that we didn't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty good. I It's like 60% correct in a binary choice. Not terrible. Um, but anyway, I guess bottom line is, if you have huge numbers of categories, it's going to be really difficult to have enough power to do any better than, you know, 60% correct. 
in lots of brain areas. I, I tend to be more focused and I really want to know what can I learn about this particular discrimination in this region. And for that, you can't test very many categories at once. Yeah. Yeah, I had a quick question about development. I mean, I really like your work and showing that basically if you take even a five-year-old uh, five kid, you would get basically the same amplitude in terms of or responses. In, or in five, five-year-olds. Five, five-year-olds, <laughs> yes. Um, but where would you put the, the limit, basically? And how do you integrate the work which has been done on... Uh, I mean, we could not use fMRI with younger infants. It's, uh, it's very difficult. But all the work with EEG, for instance, that you have some components like the N290 or the, the P400 that are highly specific to faces, and which seems to map to the N117 adults, which has been mapped to the FFA. So it seems like very early on, after just one or two months, we can already map those uh, face-sensitive elements. I totally agree. Um, I'm trying to find this diagram. I did a review article um, a few years ago with uh, Eleanor McCone, who I think is the real kind of master of this field. Um, and it doesn't really matter, but this is um, a whole bunch of, this is looking, this is a meta-analysis, not even meta-analysis, just looking across the whole literature at lots of different behavioral experiments, looking at lots of different aspects of face processing including key signatures of face processing, like inversion effects and composite effects and so forth, and looking at whether those capacities are present as a function of age where they're tested. And what the, what the diagram shows is that every one of those abilities is present at the earliest age it's ever been tested. Often within uh, newborns who are one to three days old, you can show actually one to three day old infants, can, by, measured by looking time, can discriminate face identity for upright faces, not inverted faces. Um, and um, so many of those things are present in newborns and pretty much everything is present uh, by age four years. So I totally agree with you. Asking what happens after age five is after the fact yeah. compared to the behavioral literature and the N170 literature, absolutely. We just look where we can. You know, it's a, it's a total case of looking under the lamppost. And part of the reason we looked there was this disconnect between this large number of studies that are arguing for later development of the FFA. And it just didn't make sense to me, given these kind of data. But I think, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, the innateness question is, is tough. Even for newborns, you know, they've probably looked at faces for at least 10 minutes, if not a few hours. And who knows whether that's enough to wire up a, a region, right? Um, but certainly the question of early developing, it's abundantly clear that, um, that the basic uh, characteristics of face perception develop very early as measured behaviorally. So I would love to scan infants. We're going to try. I don't think it'll work. Thank you. Yes, uh, directly re related to the, uh, this issue, uh, what about uh, external features and, and the balance of external features and internal features in, in infant vision? There are several studies that show that children heavily rely on and much more rely on external features than, than on internal features. And for example, when you, when you test the interaction of external features and internal features, like for example, I think Axelrod and, and Axelrod, yes, and did this in, in studies, then you see that this interaction is much stronger in children than in adults. So this I think, and this stays so until the end of the first decade of life. So I, I don't think the, that face perception is qualitatively the same. Yeah, okay. I don't know that literature as well as I, I should, um, and I wouldn't necessarily dispute it, but I do think there's a, a question about whether that's a reliance on another cue that may be from a different system or an actual change in the way face perception itself works? I guess that would be the question I would have about that. Mm -hmm. Are there data that speak to that? I mean, it would be tough, like, but you know, maybe if you had a... a yeah, maybe that, that there is another interaction of systems, an object-related system and a face-related system. Maybe mm -hmm. This may be so, yes. Certainly. But, but the, yeah, certainly, but... Uh, the, the FFA strongly responds to this interaction of internal and external features. Yep. It has been shown that, that, this, that the FFA is the, uh, the site of this interaction. Yeah, but so then your question is, would that be different in kids if you could scan yeah. the kids? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's so hard to scan kids. I mean, 
um, it's going to be a tough one to answer. I think we're going to just have to be... It should, it should be different until the end of uh, the first decade of life. So maybe 10 years or 8 years. Or, or okay, or so there's a shot at it. Yeah, that would be great to know. Okay, Nancy, thank, thank you, you again very much for your talk. And I think we can directly stay on your topic. So now it's all about interaction, social interaction. And every one of you is very welcome and invited to take part in our welcome reception. And the welcome reception will take place directly behind the conference center. And there are some of our uh, uh, <laughs> helpers <laughs> uh, that will guide you uh, through the park. And please take the chance and get into interaction, get into some discussion, and you will find also lots of foods and drinks. And see you tomorrow and this evening, hopefully. <laughs>